Dealing with change makers, I thought about people who have changed me. I was on the edge of a grass landing strip just outside of the Dominican border on the island of Hispaniola. I was waiting for a little airplane to come and pick me up and take me back to the capital city. A woman came towards me and she was holding in her hands her child. Uh, the child was close to death, extremely malnourished. The stomach had exploded in size. It's, the hair of the child had turned rust color from malnutrition. The arms and legs were as spindly as sticks. And she started to beg me. Take my baby, she kept saying. Take my baby, don't let my baby die. Please, take my baby. I tried to explain to her that I couldn't do that. But she was relentless. She kept on me. Don't let my baby die. If my baby stays here, my baby will die. If you take my baby to your country, feed my baby, take my baby to a doc, my baby will live. Take my baby, please. Don't let my baby die. I was relieved when the airplane came into sight and then touched down. I rushed towards that little Piper cub. She came chasing after me, screaming at me. Take my baby, take my baby, she kept yelling. I climbed into the plane and closed the little plexiglass door and I yelled at the pilot to get us out of there. He revved up the engine, but not fast enough. She was alongside of the plane, banging on the side of the plane, screaming at me to take her baby. The engine went faster and faster and the airplane pulled away from her and down the landing strip and into the air. Halfway back to the capital city, it dawned on me who the baby was. I could hear a voice echoing down the corridors of time saying, I was hungry, did you feed me? I was naked, did you clothe me? I was sick, did you care for me? I was that child. I was that child on that grass landing strip and you didn't take me in. Oh, I couldn't have packed the child up and taken the child with me to the United States. Immigration would not allow that, but I could have done something. I did nothing. The encounter with that child and my reflections on it had a, a major influence on my life. It was a watershed event in my life. I remember the next time I had an experience like that. It was in Philadelphia, my city. I was walking down Chestnut Street, and a homeless man was walking towards me. He was schizophrenic, I'm sure. He was screaming and yelling at somebody who wasn't even there. He was musty and dirty. The thing that was most pronounced about him was this huge beard that went off in every direction. Dirty and greasy. He was holding in his hand a cup of McDonald's coffee one of those styrofoam cups that had already become messed up from the grease off of his beard. And he spotted me. And he said, hey, mister, you want some of my coffee? Well, to tell the truth, I really didn't want any of his coffee. But I knew the right thing to do was to affirm his generosity. So I took the cup and I took a sip cringing to be sure, and gave it back to him. I said, hey, you're, you're getting generous, giving away your coffee to people you don't even know. What's gotten into you today, fellow? I mean, you don't know me from Adam. Sharing your coffee with a stranger like this? He said, well, the coffee today was especially delicious. And I thought, if God gives you something good, you ought to share it with people. I thought, oh no. <laughs> this guy has set me up. It's gonna cost me $10. I said, you want something from me, don't you? He said, yeah. I want a hug. I was hoping for the $10. <laughs> he put his arms around me and I put my arms around him and then I realized something. He wasn't gonna let me go. 
He had me in this bear hug and people were passing on the streets and they were staring at me, hugging this dirty, filthy, homeless man. And, and I was embarrassed. But little by little, the embarrassment turned to reverence. And I remembered the words again. I was hungry, did you feed me? I was naked, did you clothe me? I was sick, did you care for me? And I could almost hear the words added. I was that bum you met on Chesson Street. Did you hug me? For if you fail to do it to the least of these, you fail to do it unto me. When you talk about change makers, who can question that of history, Jesus has to stand out as a preeminent change maker. He changed the very course of history. I always wanted to meet Jesus. All of my friends talked about having met Jesus. But I hadn't really met Jesus till I met him in those who were poor and hurting and in need. I saw Mother Teresa's picture on this little brochure and she said every time I looked into the eyes of a man dying of AIDS, I had this eerie sensation that Jesus was staring back at me. I believe that the same Jesus who died on the cross to rescue me from my sin and my dark side is waiting to be encountered in those that I meet, especially those who are the least and the last and the lost. I mentioned to a class yesterday that my lifestyle changed when I learned how to pray like some of my Catholic friends. I'd grown up Baptist, and I'm still Baptist. And you don't have to be Baptist to go to heaven, amen? amen. <laughs> but why take a chance? That's what I like to do. Why are you doing that? But uh, I, uh, I prayed Baptist. And you know how Baptists pray. We read off a list of non-negotiable demands to the Almighty. And we tell God a lot of stuff that God already knows. I can't imagine God responding to me by when I say, Dear Lord, Sister Mary is sick in the hospital. But God's going to say, Whoa, I didn't know that. <laughs> Which hospital? God knows what you have need of more than you know what you have need of. I think that so often our prayers are like my son when he was seven years old coming into the living room and saying, I'm going to bed. I'm going to be praying. Anybody want anything? <laughs> I, wondered whether, I wondered whether my prayer life wasn't simply a sophisticated version of that. From some Catholic friends, I learned other ways of praying. In the morning when I wake up, I don't ask God for anything. It takes me about 10 to 20 minutes to push back all the extraneous things that come running into my consciousness the minute I wake up. I don't know how it is with you, but with me, the minute I wake up, I start thinking about all the things I got to do that day. I've got to push them back and go to that place which the Celtic Christians called the thin place. And in the quietude and the stillness of the thin place, where there is nothing else save the presence of Christ. I do only one thing. I surrender. It's quite mystical. I wish I could say every morning was a time of infilling of his spirit. It doesn't happen every morning. But it does happen. To be filled with his presence, to yield and sense this spirit flowing into you. Like I said, it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens. And I find myself coming alive with that infilling of his presence or her presence. I feel myself energized. One day I got up and I was particularly alive in the spirit. I went down to get an airplane to fly out to Chicago for a speaking engagement and got to the airport late and they gave me a middle seat. And there were fat guys on either side of me. 
and they had already claimed the armrest. You know, nobody likes to talk about that, but in tourists, they have these armrests, and whoever gets there first gets them, and he, they had them, and I was squeezed in the middle, and this guy on my right was upset. Beads of perspiration on his brow, he's biting his thumb. Now, I know that there are some people who are very good at evangelism and would say, excuse me, sir, you're troubled, and laid the four spiritual laws on them and had them saved and sanctified before the plane landed in Chicago, but I'm not good at that sort of thing. But I did the next best thing. I had been energized by the infilling of the Spirit that morning. I didn't say anything. I just leaned on him, and I let the power of the Spirit flow. <laughs> you say, wait a minute, you're talking about you're talking about the Spirit of God as though it's some kind of energy force that flows into you like electricity and can flow out of you to other people. Exactly. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is more than a theology. It is this power. You say, I don't get it. Then you don't get Jesus walking down a dusty road. And a diseased woman reaches out and touches the hem of his garment and he stops and he said, who touched me? I felt power go out of me. And you say, yes, but that's Jesus. And the eighth chapter of Romans says, and the same power, the same spirit that was in Christ Jesus and raised him from the dead shall be in your mortal bodies. And I had it that day. I knew it. I just concentrated on him all the way to Chicago. When the plane touched down, I said, God, if you want me to talk to this guy, you're going to have to give me a sign. Now, there's a stupid theology. <laughs> I don't know what I was expecting. The flight attendant turning into an armadillo? I don't know. A sign. No sooner had I said this, and this guy turned to me and said, Mr., I'm in bad trouble. I need God. <laughs> I was looking for something more specific, you know? <laughs> we went into the cafeteria, and for the next hour, I shared my faith and my Christ with him. And he went through a really transforming experience. I came to him, not with excellency of words but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Change makers, for me and I guess for many, 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 many people around the world, the ultimate change maker is Jesus. And he changes me as he confronts me. He confronts me in people that I meet on the way. As I look into their eyes, sometimes I feel Christ staring back at me. He meets me in the stillness of the morning when, figuratively speaking, I go into the closet and shut the door. And the God that I meet in secret rewards me openly. Pray with me. God, fill us, connect with us, and help us to know that as we love our neighbors as we love ourselves, we are indeed loving thee. Amen.